Hello, everybody. Uh, we are uh, now uh, at the beginning of the second session uh, of this conference, of this webinar. It's about uh, law and politics. This session in particular will talk about between law and politics, return and continuity of displacement. Um, uh, this is uh, one of the issues that are at the heart of the right uh, of return of the Palestinian people. It talks about uh, law and politics. And I would like to emphasize here uh, one important issue in regard to law and politics, uh, uh, and particularly law. It is uh, one of the uh, uh, ways that uh, we uh, focus on in relation to the right of the Palestinian people to return. But it's also part of the problem that the Palestinians faced in their uh, relationship with the uh, structures of power that existed, especially currently and historically. So I hope our uh, speakers will be addressing not just the, the analysis of the law uh, and its uh, importance, but also the what law brought in terms of uh, <clears throat> Uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, actual uh, uh, um, displacement of the Palestinian people and actual uh, problems to the uh, whole uh, uh, question. And uh, besides that, the problem of how we address the issue of law and how we deal with it, which is uh, very important in relation to the question of law and, uh, and, and Palestine in particular because of the heavy reliance of the Palestinian uh, Authority on law and to a certain extent the non-reliance of the Palestinian Authority on law. So we'll start with the uh, Ardib uh, He will be talking uh, about um, he will be talking about uh, the UNGA Resolution 194 and the right of the of return in international uh, uh, in international law. Uh, Ardim says is uh, uh, at Queen's Law uh, School. Uh, Ardim says is a professor, assistant professor at Queen's University, uh, Canada. He is a former UN. Uh, 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 advisor, uh, honor advisor, uh, legal advisor, and he also was the previous uh, 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 editor in chief of the Palestine Yearbook of International Law. Uh, Ardi, please. Fadal. Thank you so very much, uh, Reem, and thank you very much to, to the organizers of today's conference. Um, I, as Reem has mentioned, I've been asked to address the status of UN General Assembly Resolution 194 of 11 December 1948 and the right of return in international law. As will be seen, the subject matter is particularly dense as the resolution itself covers a number of refugee rights additional to return, simpliciter, and the international legal basis of those rights is to be found outside of the resolution itself. So my challenge will therefore be to cover the ground as efficiently as possible without sacrificing necessary detail in the short time that I have any unaddressed points can be taken up in question and answer, which I eagerly look forward to, uh, barring which I'm also happy to receive questions via email from anyone who, uh, who cares to contact me. My talk is divided into three parts. First, I will briefly set out the immediate context within which General Assembly Res Resolution 194 was issued. Second, I will summarize the content of the resolution's terms as they relate to the right to return. And third, I will address the international legal status of the, res uh, the right to return as affirmed in the resolution. So uh, the immediate context, um, the so-called 1948 war took place between December 1947 and July 1949 and was fought in two general phases. The first phase was a non-international armed conflict, a civil war effectively, and lasted for six months. It was waged between Zionist armed organizations and loose bands of Palestinian Arab irregulars. The protagonists were woefully mismatched, as I'm sure you all know, with the better equipped Zionist forces numbering about 50,000, mostly under a central command against the ill-equipped and disunited Arab forces who numbered less than 10,000. During this phase, approximately 300,000 or more Palestinian Arabs from within the borders of the proposed Jewish state under the UN Partition Plan, General Assembly Resolution 181 of 29 November 1947, were forcibly expelled or took flight. The remainder of the war was fought on an interstate basis 
uh, following the intervention in Palestine uh, of four Arab states, Egypt, Iraq, Syria, and Transjordan on 15 May 1948, the day Israel proclaimed its uh, statehood upon the departure of the British. During this second phase of the war, Israel expanded its territory to control some 78% of Mandate Palestine, well beyond the terms of the partition resolution and approximately uh, 400,000 or more Palestinian Arabs fled or were expelled during that phase. As today, in 1947, the Zionist leadership openly coveted the whole of Mandate Palestine. Its problem was, at the time, it could only boast one third of the population and ownership of only 5.6% of the country. It was for these reasons that following the ethnic cleansing of the majority of the indigenous Palestinian Arab population in the 1948 war, their repatriation was barred by wartime decision of the Israeli cabinet in June 1948 and by the Zionists' deliberate destruction of between 392 and 418 Palestinian villages. The, the numbers, uh, other studies indicate that the numbers are even higher than that. Legislatively, this deliberate wholesale denationalization of the Palestinian Arabs and alienation from their property would be reified by subsequent passage by Israel of a series of legislation, including the Law of Return of 1950, the Absentee Property Law also of 1950, and the Nationality Law of 1952, among others. And all of this happened right under the nose of the United Nations, whose mediator for Palestine, Count Folk Bernadotte, reported to the General Assembly in 1948, and I quote, no settlement can be just and complete if the recognition, if recognition is not accorded to the right of the Arab refugee to return to the home from which he has been dislodged and the hazards and, uh, by the hazards and strategy of the armed conflict between Arabs and Jews in Palestine. The majority of these refugees have come from the territory which under the assembly resolution of 29 November was to be included in the Jewish state. It would be an offense against the principles of elemental justice if these innocent victims of the conflict were denied the right to return to their homes while Jewish immigrants flow into Palestine and indeed at least offer the threat of permanent replacement of the Arab refugees who have been rooted in the land for centuries. And so it was in this context that General Assembly Resolution 194 was passed on 11 December 1948, which called on Israel to repatriate the refugees, quote, at the earliest practicable date. Resolution 194 also created the United Nations Conciliation Commission for Palestine, mandated to help the warring states arrive at a still elusive peace, a key element of which was to document the property losses of the Palestinian Arab refugees, both movable and immovable, the latter amounting to roughly 93% of the total territory of what is today Israel. This was shortly followed by Resolution 302 in, uh, in, in which the assembly established UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, which Reem had mentioned I'd spent 12 years servicing uh, uh, some, some time ago mandated to provide humanitarian aid for the Palestinian refugees until such time as they could exercise their right to return under Resolution 194. According to the agency, the Palestine refugees, including their descendants, now number approximately 5.6 million persons. They continue to remain in forced exile and their property in the hands of others with reparations of any form denied them to say nothing of the incalculable intergenerational trauma that festers on. The terms of Resolution 194, uh, which is what I'd like to talk about now, state in relevant part that the General Assembly, in paragraph 11 of Resolution 194, in fact, the General Assembly resolves that the refugees wishing to return to their homes and live at peace with their neighbors should be permitted to do so at the earliest practical date, and that compensation should be paid for the property of those choosing not to return and for the loss or of or damage to property, which under principles of international law or in equity should be made good by the governments or authorities responsible. What does all that mean? In broad terms, the resolution has been understood by the United Nations to encompass three individual and collective rights of the refugees of the 1948 war. These are first, voluntary return to their homes and property from which they had been displaced and uprooted. Second, restitution to their homes and property 
or the right to be placed in the position the refugees would have been in, but for their illegal displacement. And three, compensation, both for the returning refugees in respect of property damaged or destroyed, and for non-returning refugees in respect of property they were alienated from, regardless if damaged or destroyed. In principle, all of this may be in addition to rights to indemnification and compensation that would arise in favor of the Palestinian refugees under general principles of international law in respect of moral damage for persecution, lost future opportunity, unjust enrichment, and physical and psychological injury, <clears throat> injury in, in line with a variety of post-World War II mass claims practice. So um, the question arises, what is the international legal status of the right to return as affirmed in Resolution 194? We talked about its substance. What is the status of the resolution? In short, it is an inalienable right rooted in both customary and conventional or treaty law that produces binding effects for all implicated by it, first and foremost, of course, Israel. To illustrate, it is best to look at two distinct but overlapping issues. First is the matter of the legal status of the resolution itself. Second is the matter of the international law bases for the content of the resolution. I shall address these now in turn. It is trite to say that General Assembly resolutions do not normally carry binding force in international law. I have to remind my students of this all the time, but I also remind them that assembly resolutions can also be expressive of an already binding customary international law. As noted by Thomas Mallison and others, the right to return is so commonplace, going back to the Magna Carta and beyond, that its existence as a customary legal right has never really been at issue. Put simply, for millennia, humans have been daily exercising their rights to return to their homes in this respect, Resolution 194 is understood not to have created any new rights vesting in the Palestinian refugees, but rather only to have affirmed already existing custom under international law. This was certainly the understanding of the UN mediator when he, when he pressed the General Assembly to affirm the right and is supported by the drafting history of Resolution 194. And it doesn't hurt that since its passage in 1948, Resolution 194 has been reaffirmed by the Assembly by overwhelming majorities on an annual basis. As noted by Judge Rosalind, Rosalind Higgins, formerly of the International Court of Justice, the practice of the General Assembly can provide a rich source of evidence of customary international law as the collective acts of states repeated by and acquiesced in by sufficient numbers with sufficient frequency eventually attain the status of law. So let me shift now to discuss the various international legal bases of the right to return as affirmed in the resolution. And there are a number of subsets of international law that evidence to varying degrees, the existence of a right to return in 1948 under prevailing international law, which inspired the passage of resolution 194. Briefly, these are international humanitarian law, the law governing nationality upon state succession, the law of state responsibility, and international human rights law. And I'd like to address these briefly uh, uh, as follows. Uh, so international humanitarian law. The right to repatriation is a fixed feature of the law governing armed conflict going back, going as far back as, as the 1907 Hague regulations, which by 1948 were regarded as binding customary international law on the authority of the Nuremberg and Tokyo war crimes tribunals. <clears throat> because the Hague regulations expressly provide that prisoners of war shall be repatriated upon cessation of hostilities, logic would dictate that the same must at least be true for civilians affected by armed conflict, including those displaced as a result of war. It bears recalling that the International Military Tribunal criminalized deportation of civilians and affirmed a number of provisions of the Hague regulations all of which were taken into account by the drafters of Resolution 194, including those prohibiting pillage, destruction or seizure of enemy property without military necessity, and protection of private property. Another subset of international law that provided the basis of the right to return as articulated in Resolution 194 is the law governing nationality upon state succession. <clears throat> 
When a territory experiences a change in sovereignty, the law on state succession requires that the succeeding or new state automatically recognize and accord nationality to the territory's habitual residents. This was affirmed in the terms of General Assembly Resolution 181, the partition plan for Palestine, and remains a core precept of the law of nationality on succession of states today. As noted by Judge James Crawford, also of the International Court of Justice, quote, if a new state tried to deport a part of its permanent population, it would be acting in clear breach of its obligations and would be internationally responsible, end quote. This responsibility would not only be owed in relation to the individuals affected, requiring a right or an option uh, in their part to return, but would also uh, be owed to other states who would otherwise have to bear the burden of hosting denationalized persons. Yet another area of international law that undergirded Resolution 194's binding character was the law of state responsibility. Although this area of international law has undergone considerable advances in recent decades, in 1948, it was sufficiently developed such that it can safely be said that by, the time, by that time, states responsible for internationally wrongful acts bore obligations to make reparation for those acts. As noted by the Permanent Court of International Justice in the Chorzow Factory case in 1928, it is a principle of international law that the breach of an engagement involves an obligation to make reparation in an adequate form. The essential principle contained in the actual notion of an illegal act is that reparation must, as far as possible, wipe out all the consequences of the illegal act and reestablish the situation which would, in all probability, have existed if that act had not been committed. So in the case of Palestinian refugees, the illegal act in question is represented by their wholesale expulsion, denationalization and expropriation of their property, which of course Israel is required to this day to make right on the strength of the principles that uh, elucidate state responsibility. And a final sphere of international law that informed resolution 194 is international human rights law. Article, Article 13, subsection 2 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, adopted on 10 December 1948 by the very same General Assembly that only a day later adopted Resolution 194, provides that, quote, everyone has a right to leave any country, including his own, and to return to his country. Now, although the Universal Declaration was not yet binding international law when it was immediately promulgated by the Assembly, as noted, the right to return had by then achieved customary status, thereby making Article 13, subsection 2 binding. In later, in later years, the right to return would be further developed in other international human rights treaties to which Israel is party, uh, most notably the 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 12, subsection 4 of which affirms that no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of the right to enter his own country, and the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, Article 5D of which provides that a state may not deny on racial or ethnic grounds the opportunity, quote, to return to one's country. Much can and indeed has been written on the subject of Resolution 194 and the issue of the right of return under international law. In the limited time I have had to address the issue, I've attempted to provide a broad introduction to the re relevant sources of law upon which the binding character of Resolution 194 is based. Many aspects of what I've addressed may give rise to questions, including about the efficacy of the law, which Reem had opened with, which I'm happy, of course, to address. But for now, I wish to conclude with a broader point that will doubtless color today's conference and certainly touches upon some of the themes that Reem introduced this panel uh, with today. We have become accustomed to understand the Palestinian freedom struggle as one touching upon any number of hot button issues, whether Jerusalem, self-determination, statehood, borders, water. But make no mistake, in 2020, as in 1948, um, since the passage of General Assembly Resolution 194, if any issue encapsulates the question of Palestine in one discrete place, it is in the festering plight of the Palestinian refugees. The Palestine problem as a whole is in essence embodied in the endless calvary, to quote Edward Said, that these people have been made to endure some four generations 
on. And it remains our collective responsibility to do what we can to help keep their struggle for dignity and justice alive, including through affirmations, yes, of the importance of international law that although clearly honored in its breach rather than in its observance, remains one of the few guideposts on the way to a new and hopeful day. So with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, pass it back to you, Reed. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ardi. Uh, thank you for this good uh, introduction, excellent one. I think it will open up uh, several questions in regard of uh, law and legality and uh, the relevance of it and the way we can actualize the right to return for Palestinian people through legal intervention, if that's possible. Uh, uh, now uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Demir Sultani. He will be, uh, he's a public uh, law lecturer at uh, uh, SAWAS. He's also the current uh, editor-in-chief of Palestine Yearbook. So we have uh, both the previous and the current one. And uh, Nimr will be addressing uh, actually the, uh, the issue of, um, internal colonialism and internal displacement. Uh, so go ahead, please. Thank you very much, uh, Reem. So my uh, presentation today will focus on the question of the internally displaced persons inside Israel, the Palestinian IDPs inside Israel in order to settle understandings that separate between assessments of the legal and political system in the so-called Israel proper and the 1967 occupied territories. These accounts that show that Israel exhibits colonial and apartheid features, they often focus on the 1967 borders and do not go beyond that. Yet, an accurate assessment of the status and the history of the Palestinian citizens in Israel challenges these limited accounts. In particular, particular, the IDPs within this minority community exhibit even more clear, clearly the repressed colonial element at the base of the constitutional structure and property relations that were established after 1948. The colonial project is obviously evident in the elaborate legal mechanisms that enabled the confiscation of most of the Palestinian citizens' lands and their general subordination by law. But in the case of the IDPs, there is a living reminder of the ethnic cleansing and displacement in 1948 at the basis of the Zionist project, which makes it worse than the South African apartheid because its main instrument was not exploitation of labor, but rather ethnic cleansing. According to UNRWA, there were 46,000 IDPs in 1948, comprising 30% out of those who remained inside Israel and became second-class citizens. These numbers do not include, however, those expelled after 1948. I'm not sure if there is an issue with the video. Okay, thank you. So as I said, the numbers, the other one number, numbers in 1948 uh, do not include those who were expelled after 1948, Palestinians who were expelled after 1948. And according to recent numbers, 2018 numbers by uh, Badil, there are 400, 415,000 Palestinians who are internally displaced inside the Green Line. Taking the IDPs as a case study illustrates that the denial of the Palestinian refugees return is primarily ideological in order to maintain Jewish supremacy as a colonial structure of disposition and not merely because of concerns about demography or security. This is illustrated by the IDPs inside Israel because their return neither changes the demographic situation inside Israel, nor does it present a credible security threat of any kind. It is thus explicable by the colonial desire 
to appropriate native lands to the service and welfare of one ethno-national grouping and deny the natives right over their homeland. This ideology finds its clearest constitutional expression in the 2018 basic law, Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. The IDP's case illustrates that the colonial logic of displacing the natives and dispossessing them from their land is internal and not only external. In other words, it's not a logic confined to the 1967 occupied territories, but can also be observed in Israel's approach to its Palestinian citizens. Thus, there is an overarching colonial logic that operates with respect to different Palestinian communities. And to the extent that colonialism is an, an ongoing structure, then it sanctions an ongoing displacement. The ongoing nature of displacement is crucial to get, keep in mind because the length of time does not weaken the right of return. Rights over homeland are not superseded by absence nor by the acquisition of nationality elsewhere. Here, here it is instructive that in 1951, the Israeli Supreme Court, which ordered the return of Ikrith residents, and in another case, the return of Al-Ghabisi residents, maintained in these cases that the state cannot argue that residents have no right to return because they established residence elsewhere. This is because the state itself illegally prevented their return. So we can call this the lack of clean hands argument. Indeed, after refusing to implement the Ikrit ruling, the state proceeded to confiscate the internally displaced persons' lands and property in accordance with the land acquisition law of 1953 on the pretext that they did not possess or use the property after being forbidding access to it. But let me focus for now on the security question because this in turn refutes the arguments by some academics who argue that although Palestinians have a right to return to Israel, Israel has no obligation to allow their return given security concerns that can override the rights implementation. But the credibility of these security arguments flounders on two grounds. First, whether they employ an expansive notion of security that seeks to maintain Jewish supremacy, ethno-national control, and maintaining a status of demographic majority. In other words, security here is inseparable from ideology. This is accentuated in a situation in which the security argument is not temporary, but rather of a permanent nature. And secondly, if security is stretched to the case of the IDPs and shown as lacking in credibility, then one is allowed to question the same arguments when employed against refugees uh, and not only IDPs. To begin with, it should be remembered that the security argument does not explain expulsions that happened after 1948 nor the prevention of return in the years that followed, often with the help of emergency regulations, defense orders, and military government apparatus that existed between 1948 and 1966. In the case of Ikrith and Berem, there is no claim that the residents represented a security risk to the Zionist militias in 1948, but nevertheless, the militias displaced them from their homes. In the case of Al-Ghabisiyi, residents were evacuated in 1948. They returned in 1949, but evacuated again in 1950. They returned in September 1951, but evacuated again. And then in, in November 1951, the Supreme Court ordered their return, but the army refused to implement the rulings. Nor does the security argument explain why Baram was destroyed by the army in 1953, and Al-Ghabi was destroyed in 1953 and 1955. Not only long after the end of the 1948 war, but also in defiance of Supreme Court orders. But let us consider two versions of the security objection to Palestinian return as expressed in Israeli jurisprudence. The Supreme Court dismissed in 1981 a petition for return to Ikrith on procedural grounds of time lapse and delay. 
It also mentioned that the security situation does not allow return given the proximity to the northern border with Lebanon. Surely this is a curi curious security rationale because it has nothing to do with the law abiding citizens or with their actions. Indeed, the court says that they were loyal, but rather the security argument here refers to circumstances external to the region and beyond the IDP's control. Another petition in 1997 followed the lack of implementation of the recommendations of a committee established in 1993 by the Rabin government and chaired by David Libai. The committee recommended in 1995 a return to a limited area in light of the change in the position of the security apparatus with respect to ECRIP. The committee stressed that it is an, an exceptional case. But given lack of implementation of the committee's recommendations, the ECRIF residents petitioned the court again. In its 2002 ruling, the Supreme Court stated that the government conceded that in strict security sense, there is no problem with the return of ECRIF residents. But the government claimed that in an expansive security consideration, their return is harmful from a propaganda and political point of view, given the negotiations with the Palestinian Authority and the fear of setting a precedent regarding return in general. The court accepted the state's position and said that it has wide discretion in political questions. So the dubious nature of the security rationale and its shifting meaning shows that the question lies elsewhere. But if the rejection of the right of return is not credible on security grounds or even demographic grounds, how can we achieve an integrated and comprehensive understanding of the colonial structure under question? The issue of the IDPs highlights that the line between the external and the internal, the enemy and the citizen is hard to draw. On the one hand, the IDPs are refugees who did not cross the borders. But Israel's borders remain armistice lines and are yet to be defined in the constitution. Effectively, IDPs are both refugees and citizens. They are refugees who are internal to the category of citizenship. This shows that analyzing the status of Palestinian citizens inside Israel cannot be reduced to the question of citizenship without considering the colonial framework and the original act of ethnic cleansing in the process of which these citizens became second class and in some cases IDPs. Consider in this context the fact that in 1950, IDPs were under UNRWA's responsibility. Then in 1952, Israel decided that they are an internal issue and henceforth UNRWA ceased to care for them. So they were external and then became internal. But as mentioned earlier in 2002, the Supreme Court accepted the government's position that return of IDPs can be prevented because of concerns related to wider refugee issues and the demand to the right of return. In other words, their return and property claims are not merely internal issues to be resolved internally. So we're back again to them being an external and not only internal issue. Additionally, the demand for return which is embodied in UN resolutions like 194 is not merely a demand for those who are external to Israel to return inside Israel, but also as is the case of the IDPs is an internal demand to return to displaced villages, dispossessed property and stolen lands. Moreover, the absentee property law of 1950 is instructive. According to the law, absentees are those who left their ordinary place of residence after the 29th of November, 1947, no matter why. This law does not distinguish between refugees and IDPs in terms of seizure of property. Instead, it treats all absentees property as enemy property. Thus, IDPs are in a curious position in which they are both citizens and their property is an enemy property captured in war. 
the Supreme Court emphasized in a case called Habab in 1954, that even if one returns and acquires a certificate that he is no longer an absentee, the custodian of absentee's property owes IDPs no fiduciary duty. Although the Supreme Court said there was a suspicion of corruption in this case, in which the property was sold by the custodian, despite the return of the absentee, it affirmed that the custodian does not hold these properties for the benefit of, quote unquote, the enemy. This enmity is obviously not compatible with notions of equal citizenship at the basis of an inclusive demos. More recently, the Supreme Court in 2015 ruled that the absentee's property law of 1950 is applicable to East Jerusalem, which was illegally annexed in 1980. And thus the state can use the absentee's property law to confiscate Palestinian property in East Jerusalem. This means again, that the line between 1967 and 1948 has been effectively and legally undermined in multiple ways because the same legal instrument that was deployed against citizens is also deployed in an area occupied in 1967. So these considerations illustrate that we need to see the similarities between Israel's treatment of different Palestinian communities, the ideology that animates it, and the structure that enacts it. Palestinians generally, and the IDPs in particular, are an impediment to the settler colonial project, a project that aspires to a totalistic conception of sovereignty exclusive Jewish control of every part of Palestine. So this leads me to a final point. Faced with such a colonial project, we need to observe the limitations of the discourse of rights or what Abbott called in his uh, lecture, the uh, legalism and humanitarianism. Here we can distinguish between two approaches amongst the IDPs inside Israel themselves. On the one hand, legal, individualistic, focusing on the discourse of property rights. And on the other hand, a collective and a political approach focusing on the return discourse and connecting the IDPs to the general question of stateless refugees. Ekrith and Berem followed generally the first path as part of a citizenship discourse. They emphasized in their petitions to the court that this, this is a special case, that there was no hostility or fighting in 1948 when they were displayed and that they are not part of the general right to return. Despite this limited discourse, they refused the alternative of monetary compensation. They refused the option of compensation with other lands and demanded return to the villages themselves. But this legal venue within the Israeli legal system failed because even in the aerial cases of victory, these were procedural and technical in their reasoning and did not affirm or endorse or advance a right to return. And moreover, they were not implemented by the army which proceeded to demolish the villages. And finally, later decisions showed an approach of judicial deference to political considerations. Thus, this approach arrived at a dead end. In contrast, and after Oslo, we saw an effort towards collective organization to make the IDP's issues a national question for the Palestinian minority inside Israel as a whole, culminating in establishing in 1995, a committee to represent and mobilize the IDP's. Efforts at consciousness raising included Nakba commemorative days and visits to the sites of demolished villages. And finally, internationalizing the IDP's question beyond the confines of citizenship by ways of submissions to UN committees. The latter approach offers a better anti-colonial framing. In the Zionist discourse, whether the right-wing Sharon or the liberal Zionist Aharon Barak, Palestinian citizens have rights in the land, but they do not have rights over the land. 
Such discourse erases history, does not acknowledge historical injustice, and recognizes Palestinians as individuals rather than a collective with self-determination rights. Yet, as the IPP's case shows, Palestinians have a right over their homeland and their return to their homeland has to be a part of the fulfillment of their collective right to self-determination. Thank you. Thank you, Nimer. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll be, uh, um, we'll be with uh, Sahar Francis. Uh, Sahar is the director of the Damir. She's a human rights lawyer and director of the Damir. Dam Damir is a, <clears throat> a prisoner support and human rights association. And uh, she will be talking to us about Jerusalem and internally displaced uh, in, in Jerusalem. So go ahead, please. Good evening and thanks a lot for the Center for Palestinian Studies in SOAS for organizing this and everyone who was involved and uh, thanks Nimer for inviting me to attend in this session. Actually to follow on your discussion about the uh, uh, internally displaced and focusing on what's going on in East Jerusalem but I think it's very important to keep in mind that Israel, since its creation as a colonial uh, project, was using uh, law, actually, as a tool to oppress and uh, to impose power and to impose control over the Palestinians, definitely inside the state, and later on when they uh, uh, continued to occupy, like, the occupation in 1967, they used more or less uh, the same military regime that was imposed in the 48 areas. And with the military laws, they developed all the structure of power that controls still today the life of the Palestinian people. The, the, the case of Jerusalem actually reflects a, a, a lot this um, um, contradiction at some points between the, the, the law, the elaboration on the law and the political will uh, when it comes for frames like security, what it would be uh, uh, affecting the rights of the people, how Israel treated the Palestinian uh, population in East Jerusalem after the uh, occupation. And it shows that actually the colonial apartheid regime is continuing uh, uh, and it, it never stopped in 1948. And uh, I would argue that without the, uh, uh, the complicity of the international community, it wouldn't work and it wouldn't continue all these years. And Maybe when uh, getting into much details about the cases of the uh, uh, Jerusalem residents and how Israel were uh, displacing them and deporting them and using the law in order to confiscate their IDs and how the international community is not interfering and not stopping these uh, crimes and uh, uh, still claiming that East Jerusalem is an occupied territory and talking about two-state solution, this is uh, uh, complicity and this is what gives Israel the green light actually to continue in their violations. So immediately after the occupation, Israel was implementing the Israeli law in East uh, Jerusalem. They, uh, imposed the military regime in the rest of the West Bank and Gaza, but for East Jerusalem, much before the annexation and the law of uh, Jerusalem as uh, the capital of the state of Israel, the basic law of 1980, actually since the beginning, Israel implemented the Israeli law on East Jerusalem, which meant for the population that they became, uh, not with their uh, will, of course, uh, 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 residents of the state that occupied them. And Israel was fully aware that these uh, population are uh, Palestinians, that they are not willing to be Israelis, but still they granted them the uh, permanent residency. And with all 
theoretically, of course, with all, with all what it means to be a resident inside the state, but still in different ways, of course, and not just directly in the uh, laws that was related to the uh, like residency and nationality and uh, entering to the state, but also through policies of housing, land, a, a, a economical situation, taxation, and so on. They did everything in order to push Palestinians to leave their city for different reasons, and by this to get minimum people in the city and to keep this supremacy of the Jewish uh, uh, people living in East Jerusalem. Uh, actually, it's a very detailed subject if we want to discuss all the issues of family unification, leaving uh, Jerusalem to live in the West Bank or in Gaza, leaving Jerusalem to live abroad for study or for work or no matter for what reason if you leave the city, and all the Arnona, the city tax policies, all the uh, uh, house demolitions, and the uh, policy of uh, um, like the uh, all this custodial uh, uh, absentees property law that was lately imposed as well in East Jerusalem with the wall that excluded neighborhoods of Jerusalem in order to minimize the Palestinian population. I would focus just on the issue of the uh, uh, it's not a new policy, but this is, was used actually after the Palestinian election for the parliament in 2006, when it happened in East Jerusalem as well, revoking residency of uh, permanent residents in Jerusalem uh, based on the uh, claim that they are breaking allegiance to the state of Israel. And uh, uh, it started uh, actually with four Palestinian uh, parliamentarians who were elected in 2004 uh, for the Palestinian uh, Legislative Council. They were all from uh, East Jerusalem. Immediately when they uh, won the election and it was declared that they became members of the parliament, uh, the Israeli interior minister decided to revoke their residency based on the claim that they are now hostile to the state of Israel because they became members of the uh, Palestinian parliament. Although Israel uh, in the Oslo agreement accepted that the election will take place, including in, a, in East Jerusalem, not just this, in the election of 2006, actually Israel uh, government was in a discussion with the Palestinian government at that time, and they enabled the election to take place not just in Jerusalem, in the Israeli post offices in East Jerusalem, they facilitated the uh, election. They were aware that Hamas is sharing as well in the election and they never opposed this. Uh, they just started two, uh, three months before the election to arrest Hamas activists and Hamas political leaders who were uh, 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 involved in the election. Of course, later they arrested more than 48 parliamentarians and by this, they totally paralyzed the Palestinian parliament since then. But with these four people, uh, they revoked their citizenship based on this uh, allegation. And then uh, um, uh, uh, these people in, in June 2006 were arrested actually by the Israelis with the other uh, parliamentarians. The uh, petition that they submitted against this decision of the interior ministry to the Israeli high court were freezed because they were arrested. The discussion started whether this is was legal or illegal based on Article 11a of the uh, 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 law of nationality and the entry to Israel, whether the interior minister really have the right to uh, revoke the um, uh, uh, residency of the people from Jerusalem based on uh, allegiance. And uh, the discussion in the high court uh, were continued just after their release. Uh, some of them were released in 2010, some of uh, 2011, 
but the four of them for some period, they were entering to the office of the Red Crescent in uh, the Red Cross, sorry, in East Jerusalem. And they were living there for more than one year and a half. At one point, the Israeli police invaded the uh, Red Cross premises and they arrested them again and so on all the time. Uh, the discussion in the high court was delayed and delayed till actually uh, in 2018, uh, the High Court decided that the uh, Interior Minister don't have the right to revoke the, uh, uh, like the residency of the uh, people in Jerusalem based on allegiance because uh, uh, actually they were aware as a state that these people are Palestinians, residents of or citizens of Jordan, Israel wants to um, uh, they actually, before the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, most of the Jerusalem people were with uh, Jordanian passports, and this is why uh, Israel were considering them as well Jordanians. And uh, uh, the High Court, in the same decision on uh, the case of these four parliamentarians, the case is known as uh, Abu Arafi, after uh, uh, Khalid Abu Arafi, the parliamentarian, uh, was rejecting the decision, but they enabled the, in the like they they said the fulfillment of the decision would be freezed for six months, and then we will enable the Interior Ministry to go to the Knesset and uh, to try to get amendment to the law of 1952. And this is what happened actually. The uh, uh, law was amended in 2018 and in March 2018, actually. And uh, 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 after the amendment, the interior minister again issued a decision to revoke the residency of uh, the four people. And the four people were deported to Ramallah because in this case, these people, they don't have any other residency. So Israel uh, and Jordan, of course, closed the borders. Uh, Jordan, since 2000, uh, the break of the Second Intifada, they have a very good policy that if Israel wants to deport any Palestinian from the occupied territories, whether East Jerusalem or the West Bank or Gaza, they don't accept, they close their borders. So there's no other way. Uh, they, they remained in Ramallah and they petitioned again the Israeli High Court. In the same time, in 2016, uh, uh, the uh, anti-terror law was issued in, in Israel. And of course, this law changed the definition and widened the, the definition of a uh, terror of act of terror, actually to include a very wide range of political activism if it's done under a, a party or organization that is defined by the Israeli uh, 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 low by the uh, or the military orders as a uh, act of terror as a terror organization. Uh, so these people now are uh, considered to be terrorist uh, uh, members in Hamas, of course, and this is why they are uh, trying to revoke their residency. It was used also since 2015 against. Uh, Palestinian uh, uh, who are um, convicted or awaiting trial to be involved in uh, attacks against Israelis in East Jerusalem. Two of them actually uh, in the same period of 2015, 2016, they were also uh, arrested for um, in being involved in attack and immediately the interior ministry issued the same decision to revoke their residency. In this uh, case, actually, uh, Hamouked, the Israeli Human Rights Center, issued the petition in their name while they are still in prison inside Israel. And the interior ministry and the, again, the uh, high court delayed the uh, uh, the ruling, the ministry didn't uh, react. Just this year in September, the interior ministry said that they uh, withdraw from their decision without actually exhausting the uh, case in the high court. 
In the same uh, uh, month, in September uh, 2020, our colleague in Domir, our lawyer um, from Jerusalem, Salah Hamouri, he was also an ex-prisoner. He uh, received uh, a decision from the interior minister that his residency would be revoked as well, based on the same uh, claim that uh, he broke allegiance to the state of Israel because he was arrested in 2004 and sentenced for seven years on a, a, a crime like to be involved in uh, uh, planning to kill Ovadia Yosef, the interior minister in Israel. Uh, Gid um, he's from the same party uh, uh, of uh, this religious uh, rabbi, Ovadia Yosef, and this is, shows that there's no um, uh, like uh, clean intention uh, for the interior minister. Salah Hamouri, it's not, of course, the uh, only harassment against him or uh, the attempt to deport him uh, from the country. After his release in 2011 in the exchange deal, actually, and he almost uh, served the whole sentence, he was rearrested under administrative detention. His French wife uh, was deported from Palestine. She was living with him in Jerusalem, working in the French embassy actually, and she was deported to give birth. She was pregnant in the eighth month, uh, uh, deported back to France to deliver their uh, child. And by this actually, they, uh, uh, the um, Salah's child cannot get the Jerusalem ID. Now they came with this uh, um, claim and imagine, uh, like all the uh, uh, um, all what Salah was involved in happened much before the uh, um, initiative of this law, uh, the changes, the amendment, much before the uh, uh, anti-terror law of 2016, and still they want to implement it retroactively. Of course, uh, uh, this is not just against uh, Salah. We believe that this is a test case. Currently, in the other cases of the four parliamentarians and another uh, Jerusalem uh, uh, person, the High Court on the 26th of October asked the Interior Ministry, with the acceptance, of course, of the Interior Ministry to freeze the uh, decisions till the high court take decision on the cases of the parliamentarians and still the interior ministry issued the decision against Salah and they uh, are asking him for a hearing. The oral hearing would be in three days in the interior ministry to hear his uh, 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 arguments against this decision. Of course, this policy of using the anti-terror law, the uh, entry to Israel uh, law against the people from Jerusalem without any consideration that this uh, uh, population is a protected population under the international law as East Jerusalem is considered to be uh, an occupied territory. So the fourth Geneva Convention definitely gives protection for the civilians inside the city that the state cannot deport them. The state cannot enforce, uh, uh, of course, enforce allegiance on uh, people under occupation. This is according to the Hague Agreement, uh, 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 Article 45 of the Hague. And uh, uh, of course, Israel don't, except uh, first they don't agree that uh, East Jerusalem is considered to be an occupied territory, and then uh, they don't implement the international human rights or international humanitarian law when it comes for the occupied territory. So in paradox, while they don't agree that East Jerusalem is uh, occupied, they still don't consider the people uh, in East Jerusalem uh, as full citizens of the state that they should uh, uh, get uh, the full rights of the people. And uh, of course, um, while the international uh, community, the international UN with hundreds, with tens of UN resolutions confirming that East Jerusalem is still occupied and uh, uh, um, I think that most of the countries, members of the UN knows the situation. Uh, definitely the European countries and those who have uh, 
um, good relations with the Palestinian Authority and they have embassies and uh, uh, they have representative offices in the occupied territories with the Palestinian Authority are fully aware about all these uh, um, policies and restrictions of the Israeli side in order to evacuate uh, in Jerusalem. Of course, with all these uh, uh, expansion of settlements in the different neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. And the project is very clear, but still they are very silent. Nothing is happening in the international level. Nothing is enforcing Israel actually to abide to the international law and to their, uh, uh, um, like, to the, uh, uh, and, and to protect at least the rights, the basic rights of the Palestinian people, the basic right of to remain in their own city, to remain nationals of their own uh, city, to be able to leave the city and to come back uh, to the city. Because one of the procedures uh, for long years that is used against Palestinians in East Jerusalem, if you leave the country for three years, and you don't come back, you will lose your residency. And if you leave for seven continuous years, that's it, it's over. You will never be able to go back. All the difficulties for those who left to live in the West Bank and they were enforced because Israel decided to revoke their residency because they considered after uh, like that, leaving to live in to Bethlehem or Ramallah would mean that you are not anymore a Jerusalem resident. Thousands of people lost their residency by this uh, policies and they were like enforced to come back to rent one room in East Jerusalem, just in order to show that still the center of your life is East Jerusalem and to be able uh, uh, to continue to live in your uh, uh, city. By, um, the years, I will end just with a few statistics about how many uh, um, Jerusalem residency were revoked just based on the fact that people left Jerusalem no matter what, as I said, whether to study, whether uh, uh, to live, to work abroad uh, in, from 67 till uh, 2018, actually 14,643 Palestinians were losing their residency in uh, Jerusalem because they either left to uh, outside the country or uh, to the West Bank. So I think what we need to do is to, to really think about the question that was raised in the previous section about the international law and the international human rights law and the use of this uh, mechanism and the importance of this mechanism uh, 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 when the powerful state actually have the right and have the will and have the political to decision to impose and to enforce international law in such contexts like Ukraine and uh, the Kerm with Russia and Sudan and other uh, 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 realities, but never against the Israelis when it comes for the protection of the rights of the Palestinians. Thank you. Thank you, Sahar. Uh, this is a question for uh, all the panelists, I think, that the one you raised. Uh, now we'll have Dr. Jilber Ashkar, who, is, uh, who will be presenting about the right to return between fantasy and uh, reality. Professor Ashkar is a professor of development studies and international relations at uh, SAWAS. Uh, please, Tfadbal, uh, Doctor. Shukran, <clears throat> Shukran Reem. Um, yeah, and, uh, and uh, many thanks to, uh, to, to Nimr and uh, Aki for the organization of, uh, of this conference, the, uh, the organization of the agenda by Nimr and uh, Aki for his uh, help in, in the technical organization, especially on a weekend. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Ardi gave us a very learned uh, uh, um, presentation on the, the, the legal aspect of, uh, of, uh, of uh, UN General Assembly Resolution 194. Uh, and I will address the, the, the question of, of, of uh, the right of return uh, from the political angle. 
as a complement, one could say, to the uh, uh, legal uh, dimension uh, that was uh, discussed uh, previously. And uh, the, the, the title I gave, The Right of Return Between Fantasy and Reality, is in, indicative of, uh, of uh, what I mean, uh, which would be focused on the uh, representations, if you want, or the imagination uh, of return and of the right uh, of return and how it has evolved with time, because that's very important also to take into consideration. Uh, we are dealing with a conflict which is uh, 70 plus years uh, old, I mean, since the, the, the creation of the Israeli state, which in terms of history, it's not a, it's not a very long period since uh, people have been through that and uh, it's all still uh, in, in living memory for, uh, for, for uh, a lot of people. And so, of course, the, the, there has been a, a shift or an evolution over time of the representation of that and of, of what return means or the right of return. So uh, the, 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 the initial uh, um, the representation of that, which is uh, at the time of the, the General Assembly's uh, resolution, uh, so in 1948, and in the period between 48, one could say, and uh, 67, and uh, the, the June 67 war, and the occupation of the rest of Palestine by uh, uh, the Zionist state, um, the, that was a period when the representation was uh, understandably so, I would say, one of, uh, of a return, massive return of the Palestinians to their uh, homes and properties between quote marks be, uh, referring to the terms use, used in the, uh, in the resolution. So it was a matter of, of return of people who have been uh, uh, displaced, uh, expelled, deported, or have fled, simply fled the war in the hope of, of, of returning. I, I uh, often say that uh, the, the, whatever discussion one may have about the reason why the Palestinians left their homes in 48, uh, even if, if all of them just fled, uh, they, this doesn't change anything to the right of return and to the fact that the, the Israeli state prevented them from, from, from doing so. There is the usurpation uh, uh, in that fact, in the, in, the, in, in the prevention of return. And that's what the, 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 the right uh, of return uh, is, is about. But as I was saying, the, the, the initial representation in the, the immediate uh, 48 and post 48 period was one of, uh, of, of that uh, kind of, of uh, how to say, uh, it, it was a representation of, of uh, uh, if you want, the, the, the film of Zionist conquest being uh, run in reverse. Uh, the, the, the reversing the film of Zionist conquest and getting back to the uh, pre-48 uh, uh, situation. And uh, that entailed what uh, we could call uh, um, a bourgeois representation of return in the sense that when you have the concept of property, it is by definition, uh, you are by definition within uh, the, the bourgeois law, if you want. And here I would uh, I want to quote from uh, uh, a book that uh, came out in 1970, which was a collection of essays actually by uh, Sadiq Jalal Azam, 1970. Uh, Dirasat Yasaria fil Qadiyya al Palestinia, uh, left wing studies in the uh, Palestinian, about the Palestinian cause. And uh, that's what, how he was describing at that point the, the representation of liberation, which is directly connected, of course, to, to return, to the right of return, uh, between 48 and, uh, and 68. Uh, I'm quoting here, um, liberation used to generate in people's imagination, a view of Arab armies entering Israel as conquerors, after which every Palestinian would dust off his old papers and go to the Arab conqueror to show him a document proving his property of this house or that piece of land. The victor would then give back to each their rights as if nothing had happened. In other words, liberation meant that the feudal landlord 
would get back to his property, the big bourgeois to his trade and capital, the petit bourgeois to his shop, the worker to his hard labor, and the destitute poor to his homelessness and misery. End of quote. Uh, and indeed, that's, that's uh, quite accurate represent, I mean, uh, uh, description of the kind of representation that was dominant uh, until then, and uh, also in the uh, official Arab discourse and the uh, official Palestinian discourse that existed at that time. And uh, it has uh, its uh, symmetric counterpart in the Zionist representation of return. So you had some kind of uh, uh, symmetry and therefore uh, 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 resemblance between the Zionist representation of the return of the Palestinians uh, um, and the, the representation of that return by, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 if we take two uh, re representative or more or less representative bodies of the time, the, the, the post-48 uh, Arab Higher Committee, that is uh, Amin Husseini, and the pre-68 PLO and Ahmed al-Shuqairi. And uh, what they have in common is, is this kind of conception of liberation uh, with the idea that all the Jews that came after 1948 uh, should uh, should go back from from where they came should go back to Europe or or, or, or wherever, I mean the, the idea that they have no right uh, to to remain there, that is related to this return as return to land property houses and all that which means that all those that came after forty eight, and uh, uh, took them over should uh, be uh, be uh, leaving. Uh, in the 60s, this developed also in a, in a kind of, of belief at the beginning of the idea of armed struggle and the rest. Uh, the Algerian scenario was very much uh, the one through which this representation would, would uh, take place. And we know how it uh, happened in, uh, in Algeria, which is after independence, you, has, you had a mass exodus of the, of the uh, uh, European uh, settlers uh, in Algeria. And therefore, you had a kind of similar representation that uh, uh, the liberation of Palestine will be something uh, akin to the Algerian scenario, with a mass exodus of the Jews um, to uh, to Europe or the United States or whatever. Uh, now, after '67, you had a shift, a major shift in the representation of of liberation and of all that. And gradually, you had a repudiation by the, the post-68 PLO, which after being taken over by the uh, Palestinian resistance uh, organizations, um, uh, you had a, a repudiation of, a gradual repudiation of this idea of, uh, of uh, uh, expelling, uh, you know, or uh, denying the right of part of the Jewish population uh, to remain. And hence, you had the, these formulas that were formulated since that time since uh, 68, 69, uh, the uh, democratic secular state uh, in Palestine. Uh, you had uh, a liberal uh, uh, conception of the binational state in Palestine. And you had also a socialist conception that was at that time, at that uh, early time, the, the democratic front, the socialist, a socialist binational also cons uh, view of, of a future state uh, in, uh, uh, in Palestine. And of course, the, these were not only uh, the, the result of, uh, of uh, a political evolution, but they reflected also the, 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 the effect of, uh, of time and also of shifting military realities. Uh, the War of 1967, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the 1970, the, the crushing of the Palestinian resistance in, in Jordan, the end of, of, of Nasser and what he represented, all this uh, uh, um, ended to a large degree the military conception of liberation. Uh, until then, you had a military conception of liberation as war, as, as I said, a conquest in reverse. Uh, uh, now you have uh, you, th this, this gradually uh, ended. And of course, this will be taken forward by the Intifada in 1988 and the completion of, um, of the post-1970 shift of the PLO uh, towards the two-state perspective. Uh, and this will lead, of course, as we know, uh, to, to Oslo, where the right of return were, was basically put on the shelf uh, for future negotiations. Uh, 
uh, that was part with Jerusalem and other issues of the issues that were not, uh, uh, even the settlements actually were not uh, uh, decided upon in, in the Oslo uh, agreement. Uh, now, the, the key issue here is that uh, with, despite all the shifts in the, in the realities that I mentioned, uh, the, 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 the right of return persisted, and I would say rightly so, throughout all these phases as part of the uh, fundamental and imprescriptible Palestinian rights. And they, I mean, the term imprescriptible should, would deserve a, a, a comment on it, but it's very important because that's exactly what, what this right is, is about. It, it doesn't end with, with time or with uh, anything else as uh, previous also uh, presenters uh, have said. And hence we, we, we find, for instance, this right uh, reaffirmed in the, in the, uh, in the last uh, uh, statement of a, some kind of uh, collective Palestinian view, which was the prisoners, the 2006 prisoners document, um, which uh, included this formulation, the traditional formulation, the right of the refugees, I'm quoting, to return to their homes and properties from which they were expelled and to get compensated. So this is a, a formulation that uh, 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 reproduces that of the uh, UN uh, resolution and remains within the same conception that we had at the beginning and what I described from, let's say, the point of view of uh, here, the, 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 the the sociology or philosophy of right as a bourgeois conception of, uh, of, uh, of return. And we have it illustrated just recently, yesterday, Nasser, <clears throat> Nasser Qudwa, a former minister in the uh, Palestinian Authority, uh, who, who uh, published an article where he says, we have decided to open the records for every Palestinian to be able to check on their property and in certain cases obtain the, the documents if they don't have them, you know, documents establishing their property. And for this, a database was established with 210,000 owners and 540,000 parcels of land. And this is based on research in uh, British land and tax registers. Now, I mean, this may be interesting uh, historically, but I would say I, this is, in my view, of, of quite limited use compared to the much more useful work of uh, Salman Abu Sitta for, uh, in, in covering the, the Zionist eraser of Palestinian villages. The, the, the how, I mean, uh, under this, the, the, the Israel, there is Palestine, and Palestine has been erased by, by the Israeli state as a Zionist uh, uh, project. Um, from the property perspective, uh, unless precisely we are looking at each one's property, as this, uh, what I just quoted would mean, uh, it is sufficient to know that only close to 6% are the, I think mentioned that, of British mandate Palestine belonged uh, uh, to, uh, to Jews before, uh, before 48. And, and despite that, we know that they were given 56% of the land by the UN 1947 partition, and they ended up seizing, if you, if you calculate uh, what uh, doesn't belong to Palestinians uh, in Palestine, in historical Palestine, that would be uh, the, the Zionist uh, control more than 75% or own more, more than 75% of, uh, of, uh, of this land. So to, to, to conclude with, with the, the crucial point here, what, are, what does the right of return mean today? Uh, are the uh, uh, quoted from the resolution. I would say it, there are two principles there. One is the right of return, and two is the right to reparations. Now, the right of return is a right, of course, like any right. I mean, you, you, you may use it or you may not. That is, there's no obligation to return. It's a right. And the conception of that today cannot be through war, we know that the realities of uh, the military realities, anyhow, may make that kind of scenario uh, uh, impossible, uh, but through a political process. So it's not, it can't be a return to homes and properties 72 years later, but a return to the territory uh, of Palestine where the settlement of ret returnees should be organized and funded. And that is related to a right also of statehood whether it is a binational solution or even, I mean, 
this is up to the Palestinian people to decide, even maybe a new partition, not the 78 slash 22 kind of, uh, of uh, uh, separate uh, partition that uh, prevailed after 50, 48, but uh, a reconsideration of all that and how people live on the territory of Palestine. And here, there is a distinction between the, in, the right of return, which is an individual right, and the right to self-determination, which by definition is a collective right. And the second point and, um, uh, 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 is the right to reparations. And these have to be paid by the, uh, as the law itself says, the, not the law, the, the resolution, by, uh, well, it doesn't say it in, uh, directly, but implicitly by the Israeli state. And I would say by international contributions because the UN has a direct responsibility in the creation of, uh, of the, uh, this, uh, the, this, uh, this tragedy. And this would be, uh, these reparations are to be paid for the sake of A, the collective settlement of returnees, and B, the individual compensation for non-returnees, but that would be then on an egalitarian basis, since suffering cannot be measured and is certainly more important than lost property. I mean, we know that the poorest suffered the most in refugee camps. And so if, I mean, if compensation is based on what people, be, uh, uh, what uh, kind of belonging they had before, that would be completely unfair and uh, unjust. And a final point I end with that is what I see as the necessary complement to the right of return, which is disconnecting this right, as uh, previous speakers said, from the condition of refugee. And in the same way that if you get uh, citizenship in America or elsewhere, you don't lose your right uh, uh, of return and everything that uh, it entails, I, 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 it's, I think it's very important to emphasize the right of diasporic Palestinians uh, to, to live, in, live in the Arab countries and where have been based for decades and most of them today has been, uh, were born, the right to acquire equal citizenship rights and end this other apartheid uh, that exists in the most blatant form, I would say, in a country like Lebanon, for instance, where there is uh, there's no other term that applies to the condition of Palestinians in Lebanon than the one of apartheid. And this is also something that should be ended. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to the question and answer. We have uh, several questions and answers. A question. Uh, well, we start with the uh, Osama Makabisi question about the status of our the Arab state's position in regard to uh, 194, UN Resolution 194. And does this uh, position matter anymore? Did it ever? Uh, this is one question. Uh, the second question is addressed to are the uh, in regard to the efficacy of the available international legal frameworks in relation to Palestine uh, in relation to the issue of right to return. Uh, we have also there's asking Nimer uh, about uh, the pre present Palestinian internally displaced person in Jerusalem uh, are product of the colonial structure that caused the displacement of 1948 Palestinian refugee then shouldn't these receive protection and assistance from UNRWA who really protecting, uh, who really protect them, okay? Uh, question again to Ardi, do you see law as an obstacle to both Palestinian refugees and internally displaced person? Is occupation law violent as both uh, uh, a question of law and politics? Uh, <clears throat> There is also a question in regard to what extent uh, is the Israeli refusal to uphold and recognize the, nine, uh, the 194 resolution on secre security grounds limiting potential diplomatic peace negotiation. Uh, we have a question about the status uh, to Sahar, the status of Palestinians as stateless in Jerusalem uh, and their situation as internally displaced. How do you understand these intersections, intersections of being stateless and internally displaced at once. Uh, we have uh, Tagrid who wants you to actually uh, repeat how many people lost their residency between 1967 and 2018. Um, uh, shall we uh, answer these questions and move to the next ones? Uh, what do you prefer? I'm happy to uh, to take the yeah. questions that have been put to me. Uh, I mean, 
I just can't um, open my video. So I'd be grateful if you could, uh, there we are. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, as to what the best uh, action to improve the efficacy uh, of uh, the implementation of the right to return, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, my, my general sense is that, and this goes to uh, at least one or two other questions on the efficacy of international law and law as, as, a, as a construct. Um, there's a lot of un, uh, heightened expectations uh, over the years um, uh, put in uh, by elites, put uh, uh, in the hands of um, or formed by the general public as to what law can actually produce. We've heard, for instance, from Nimr and Sahar today about how law has been abused uh, domestically by Israel, that is within its domestic legal systems, to further effectively a political course. Uh, we know what the political course is. We know what the issue is. The framing for Israel is how do you, and I'm quoting now Nur Masalha, how do you establish and maintain a Jewish state in a place full of non-Jews, right? You necessarily have to manage that demographic problem. And of course, the Palestinian refugee problem is the apex of that uh, and their ethnic cleansing is. Enter law. Law is merely a, a tool uh, to be uh, uh, used, ideally uh, to um, balance out interests between unequal parties and give a sense of justice and arrive at some form of, of, of solution that is Pacific, a Pacific settlement uh, of, of, of disputes between uneven parties. But oftentimes it doesn't operate in those, in those terms and in that way. Law can be used, indeed has been used historically, and this is not unique to Israel or Palestine. Law has been used and can be used historically to oppose, uh, uh, suppress others and, and uh, other individuals in, in uh, furtherance of immoral um, and uh, what might be at one point legal, but later on be understood as illegal practices. Nuremberg, for instance, the Nuremberg laws were laws. Apartheid was legal at a certain time and so forth. This does not mean that law does not matter. And it does not at all mean that um, the right to return under international law or international law generally does not matter. The better understanding of how law operates in the human world is to appreciate that it has embedded within it both, and I'm quoting now or paraphrasing now uh, uh, Marty Koskinen, an apology for power but also a plea for a utopia or a better place, a better society, et cetera. So the, the short answer to the question, what efficacy the right to return and how might it be implemented? Or for instance, has the law of occupation been violated or been used to violate the rights of refugees and other such? The short answer is that law is but one tool to be used both in the hands of those who fashion it, oftentimes states, who might use it to abuse people's rights, um, but also by victims who use it as entry points to press the legitimacy of their claims. Now, it is clear that the Israelis have violated the right of the Palestinian people to even exist in the land. They dispossessed them, and we have a right, the Palestinian refugees have a right to return to that land. It is affirmed. It would be folly for us by the General Assembly annually of the United Nations. It would be folly for us to say, while well, law does not matter, um, we must make use of it. Uh, and it. And that means, practically speaking, to do what you and I are doing here now, but also to insist that the refugee plight through the lens of law, its bourgeoisie origins notwithstanding, thank you very much for that, Gilbert, um, uh, continue to be the framework through which we envision or understand the Palestine problem. Uh, the plight of the Palestine refugees needs to be placed back on the agenda front and center. And this is, this is on the Palestinian leadership. It's on the Palestinian people. Uh, it's on us to make sure that this happens. Why would that be the case? Because uniquely, the issue of the Palestine refugees, uniquely among all the issues that are outstanding as between the Palestinians and the Israelis, points up the essence of the problem before us. How do you create a Jewish state and maintain it in a place full of non-Jews? You must necessarily get rid of them. And that's what happened. And at the at bottom, we have a settler colonial movement that covets more Palestinian land with less Palestinians in it 
And the best, most just resolution of how to deal with that necessarily requires that the original sin of what took place in 1948 be uh, righted. And this requires us to affirm, despite the fact that the law is not adhered to, to continually affirm at every moment we get the right of the Palestinian refugees, indeed the right of every refugee, no matter who they may be, to return to the homes from which they've been displaced. I'll stop there for now. Nimr? Uh, Sahar and Gilbert for the thanks, uh, but I should emphasize again that this is a joint conference uh, with uh, between SOAS, the University of Houston, and uh, Bir Zaid. So I would like to thank also Reem al Botmi and Abed Takriti for their uh, uh, being co organizers of this conference and helping make it uh, happen and a possibility. So I would like to address a few points. The first point is the question that Osama raised uh, with respect to the uh, Arab states position. We're talking here about a handful of states who were uh, members of the uh, General Assembly at the time uh, of the UN, uh, who uh, op opposed the 194 uh, resolution. Now, in order to understand their opposition, there are different factors. So I'll mention one of them only because the 194 is not only about the right of return. It's also about establishing the UCCP, the Conciliation Commission, but also importantly for our case here is the question of internationalizing Jerusalem. So let me uh, read you the section, I think it's number eight in 194. It says that in view of its association with three world religions, the Jerusalem area, including the present municipality of Jerusalem, plus the surrounding villages and towns, the most eastern of which shall be Abu Dis, the most southern Bethlehem, the most western Ain, Ain Karim, including also the built up area of Mutsa, the most northern Shofat, should be accorded special and separate treatment from the rest of Palestine and should be placed under effective United Nations control. So I'm mentioning this point only to say that, and here I recommend an article by Anne Erfan on the question of internationalizing Jerusalem, uh, which is uh, uh, in 181 as well as uh, 194 and other UN attitudes and international attitudes that seek to separate Jerusalem from Palestine and give it a new colonial status and to be uh, supervised by a non-Palestinian authority, a non-Arab authority. So, there were also grounds to object to some of the formulations of the 194 uh, uh, resolutions. And we, we, in order to assess the Arab state's position, we need also to remember uh, those. With respect to Baha'i's question about East Jerusalem and IDPs, uh, I didn't mention that in the West Bank, there are 344,000 or so IDPs, including Jerusalem. And obviously, uh, UNRWA is supposed to care for uh, those as well. Now, I wanted to address uh, one point that uh, Gilbert raised, which is the question of the uh, separation uh, or the distinction that he uh, posited between the right of return on the one hand and the right to self-determination on the other, uh, postulating that the right of return is individualistic while the right of self-determination is collective. Now, if it can be fair to say that 194 resolution uh, uh, presents the 194 uh, right to return as individualistic, that is not necessarily true for a political perspective. So if you wanted to adopt a political rather than a legal perspective, which you uh, endeavor to do, then if we look at the political theoretical discussions of the right to return, such as David Miller, Victor Tadros, Raif Zreik, and others, what we see there, in order to justify the right to return, you need to be cognizant of the collective aspects of even the individualistic aspect of the right of return, because the idea of the right of return is, unique, is part of occupancy in homeland. And in order to return, you need to return in concert with others in order to reconstruct political communities, part of which you were, and social fabric, part of which you were. So this is the only reason and the only meaning and the only justification for the right of return, whether you conceive of it as individualistic or collective. 
And in this sense, you cannot separate between the right of return, and this is what I try to suggest in my own presentation in this panel, and between the right to self-determination. The right to self-determination for the Palestinians is empty, is vacuous, is null and void if it does not include a right to, of return that will allow the uh, substance of any form of self-determination because self-determination without a Palestinian uh, stateless refugees is obviously not a self-determination at all. And as I said, the Palestinian stateless refugees are two thirds of the uh, Palestinians. Another point of this is to say that the the right, uh, the Palestinian refugees' rights to property are individualistic and therefore are bourgeois. Now, one difficulty with this question is, we, the critical legal scholars in their uh, critique of the Marxist view of property rights and, and rights in general, is that the Marxists see rights and property in particular as constant, as not uh, flexible, while rights have proven as malleable, as proliferating, and as capable of being interpreted in different ways for different purposes in different contexts, and serve opposite sides of the, uh, 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 the uh, battleground, including, uh, as uh, David Harvey shows in his book, uh, A Brief History of New Liberalism. So the idea of property is usually disaggregated into what we call in critical legal studies, a bundle of rights, because there are different ways to understand property and there are different effects depending what it, it means in a specific context. Now, in terms of the individual, so individualism and bourgeois character of the property, uh, property right, we need to remember that with respect to the transfer of Palestinian property in between 1948 and 1960, in particular under the Israeli legal regime, from Palestinian hands to Israeli hands, what happened here is that most of these were small Palestinian landholders, farmers in villages, and their lands were transfer, uh, collectivized and confiscated for uh, the ownership of the state of Israel. So they are hardly, can hardly be called as uh, bourgeois in, in this uh, sense. Thank you. And then we'll... Sorry, very shortly. On the question of the statistics, it's 14,643. So, uh, and on the issue of uh, how, how much difficult it makes for those in East Jerusalem to be stateless and uh, displaced in the same time. Actually, so far, all those that Israel decided to exclude outside the wall, like the full neighborhoods, uh, for example, uh, Kalandia, part of Kalandia and Kufar Aqab, what is known in between Ramallah and Jerusalem, uh, they still hold the Israeli uh, uh, ID, but they are not living in East Jerusalem as considered uh, the borders, or the municipal borders. So actually it's very, very difficult for families uh, um, for different reasons, economically and uh, sociology that they are finding themselves enforced to go back to rent one room in Jerusalem it's very expensive, it's very difficult. And to uh, uh, prove that their center of life is still in Jerusalem in order to protect their uh, uh, um, ID uh, residency. Those who lost their residency while they traveled abroad, I think thousands they didn't came back. Those who went to the United States or the Gulf countries or other countries to study and to remain there. So they lost their uh, residency. Those, there's the huge problem of those who get married with uh, uh, Palestinians from the uh, occupied territories and they are in the process of uh, uh, family unification. Israel frozen the family unification procedures since the uh, second intifada and there's hundreds of Palestinians, whether women or men, that they are living in the city without any documents and literally they are afraid to go out to the street uh, 
especially women, because if they would be arrested, they would be deported back to the uh, uh, West Bank. So I think it's really a very, very difficult situation with lots of uh, uh, details, how Israel actually is using the issue of the law in order to make more difficult for the Palestinians to stay in their uh, uh, city. And all, of course, at the end of the day, in order to keep the uh, expansion of the Israeli neighborhoods, the settlements around Jerusalem, and to change the reality. So in any future negotiations, there's nothing that is considered East Jerusalem to uh, uh, negotiate about. Shukran Sahar, I lost the middle. Shall we move on to another? Okay, uh, Gilbert. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Reem. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to to respond to Nimmer, and I hope I have enough time because he spoke for quite uh, quite at length. Um, but I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Uh, first of all, yes, there is a distinction between the right of return, the right to self-determination, in the sense that you have no obligation to return. So it's a right. It's a right, and you decide individually whether you, you want to return or you don't want to return. You can't, there can't be a collective decision about returning uh, uh, with which everyone should abide. Now, if we mean by that, that the return is not individual return, well, that's what I said. Maybe you couldn't uh, listen uh, carefully to what I said, but I spoke of the collective settlement of returnees. I didn't speak of an individual uh, uh, return. I speak of the collective settlement of returnees. So the return should be organized collectively, but as a right, it's an individual right. Everyone decides. Self-determination, I don't need to explain how it is by definition uh, a collective right. The second point is about the uh, bourgeois character of right. Well, I, we're not going to enter into a discussion about Marxism, and which you, you seem to, to, to uh, disagree with the, the Marxist conception of property, but that's, uh, you don't need to get there. Uh, but the definition of, of, of uh, uh, a bourgeois right is related to the, the notion of property itself. Now, whatever the issue, I, I'm not going to discuss philosophy with you. I'm just going to discuss one thing, the, the, the right, of, of compensation, if it has to be based on what people owned before, would be completely unfair, as I explained, because precisely those small owners, as you say, and the, the others who didn't own anything, are those who suffered most, because we know very much that the, 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 the Palestinian bourgeoisie, the Palestinian aristocracy, and all that, had uh, those who, are, who went into the diaspora among them, uh, lived a much better life than those who were kept in the camps. And that's why I'm saying that the compensation should uh, be on an egalitarian basis, uh, uh, based, uh, because precisely suffering cannot be measured and it's more important than lost property. And that's uh, the, the key point uh, I, I was making. And that's where I think the conception of uh, returning, uh, I mean, compensating, sorry, it's about the reparations, everyone on the base on, of what they own is a very flawed one. Uh, thank you. I don't think we can go for another round of uh, questions, but uh, there are questions that you might be able to address quickly in relation to basically uh, Sahar, if there is a change in the law in regard to residency uh, in Jerusalem, uh, uh, and uh, if there is possible, uh, uh, to restore uh, the uh, ID through uh, a court decision, a high court decision. Someone is saying that was possible if you stay three years in the uh, country. Uh, Ardi, I'll give you uh, time to uh, reply as well. Uh, uh, and uh, do the uh, panelists think that Israel recognition of the reality uh, and consequences of 1948 uh, and its, its responsibility for it is important for the implementation of the right of return and uh, whether the panelists think that there has not yet been any such Israeli recognition, why uh, there is no such recognition today. Um, uh, we have, yeah, if, uh, if we can address uh, uh, 
these questions and then we'll Ardi wants also to say something uh, as well. So shall we start with Ardi, please? <clears throat> Thank you, Green. Uh, very, very briefly, Gilbert, you had mentioned uh, the release recently, just two days ago, I think, by uh, uh, the Asar Arafat Foundation through Nasr al Qudwa of the records of Palestinian <clears throat> land ownership. These records are, in fact, the, the United Nations uh, uh, Conciliation Commission records from 1963 that are only housed historically in, in the hands of a few parties, the Egyptians, the Israelis, the United Nations, the Palestinians, um, and perhaps one more. Uh, the point is, I actually think it's a vital and vitally important uh, uh, um, to have ex uh, made these re records open and public. So to compare them, for instance, to the very fine work of the Palestine Land Society uh, and Salman Abu Sitta's work and say one is more important than the other, I see no reason why we should do that. In fact, they can, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. And this goes to the very first question that was put to us today. What practical actions can be done to help ensure, keep alive the right of Palestinian uh, refugees to return? And these are two very important ones. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's all I wanted to say on that point. As to the question that was just asked, just 20 seconds, as to whether or not Israeli recognition of the right to return would be required, I think that's self-evident. The answer is yes. Uh, there needs to be some form of atonement, but we're not there yet. I mean, I mean hopefully one day we will be. Um, there's no question that it is required, however, because uh, you can't have a right that is implemented unless the one who's uh, the wrong, the party who acts wrongly acknowledges that, that that right exists. Thank you. Bear, you want to say something as well? Sada. Yeah, me too. Can I say something briefly? Yeah, Sada, Sada. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very briefly. Uh, Ardi, uh, I, I, as I said, that may be interesting for, for, for historical, from the historical point of view, that, uh, uh, I mean, making these uh, uh, archives uh, uh, available. Uh, I mean, I'm not disputing the historical interest. I am, I am discussing the political interest, which is, in my view, is limited because we know anyhow that the, the amount of, of land uh, uh, taken over by the Zionist project is far beyond even what is recorded. Uh, I mean, when just the figure that you mentioned, and I also quoted the fact that 6% uh, 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 was uh, owned before 48, uh, by the, the, the on the Zionist side, so th that's that's enough in itself to 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 tell you about the the, the amount the, the proportion of uh, of usurpation that happened. Anyhow, that's I think I don't think there is a disagreement here. I'm just discussing the political perspective in which the, this kind of release came and and this issue of providing everyone with their documents about their property. Um, thank you very much. Um... I think we don't have uh, time uh, for another questions. I would like to thank the panelists. I would like to thank the uh, audience the attendees as well. Uh, there were many questions that we couldn't uh, answer them, but I hope through the answers that you already uh, heard uh, that would be addressed, uh, that addressed some of these questions. Uh, thank you very much. We're closing the session and uh, there is so to have time for the next one and hope to see you there again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.